We will now open our next session, which is Plenary 9. It's a special session on ethical leadership uh, beyond governance. Uh, may I please have on stage CS Abhijit Mukhopadhyay, President, Legal and General Counsel, Hindija Group, and Chairman, ICSI Overseas Centre UK, please. Yes, yes. Just ask people to come at all costs. online viewers waiting. I think we can start. We should start. People are coming in. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor for me to speak at uh, the international conference organized by our alma mater, the Institute of Company Secretaries of India. <clears throat> the subject that has been given to me or the topic that has been given to me is a pretty, I would not like to use the strong word uh, confusing, but something that we all aspire try to become, this is our dream, but eventually whether this happens or not, I'm not uh, very sure about it. What is the subject matter? Ethical leadership beyond compliance. Very high sounded words, extremely meaningful. That means we are talking about, we are thinking of leaders who will be like Caesar's wife, basically. Not only they should be ethical, but their ethical attitude will go beyond their normal call of duty. That is very interesting. So whatever is supposed to expect from me, I will not only do that, but I will go beyond that and try to see that I have really exceeded my excellence. So that's a pretty a dreamy kind of subject for me, no doubt about it, but no harm in uh, aspiring for it. While coming here, I was just thinking that, let me give some two quick examples what comes to my mind. This kind of leadership is available. I'm not talking about the industry. I'm just talking about the political arena, and trust me, and as a matter of coincidence, two names came to my mind. One is late Lal Bahadur Shastri. He resigned as the railway minister in the 1960s when he was in the cabinet of Pandit Nehru because there was a rail accident. He had nothing to do with the rail accident, but he resigned taking the moral responsibility. So that is the height of one we can think of ethical leadership beyond compliance. Second example I found, Nelson Mandela. He came out of the prison, South African prison, Johannesburg prison. After 27 years, no malice, nothing. He coined the word reproachment, uh, and then, uh, you know, reconciliation. So let's reconcile. Let's not continue fighting. And let's do it peacefully with the white minority in South Africa at that point of time. For 10 years, he became the president. And after 10 years, he said, I am 85 now. Enough is enough. I must step down now. Just imagine what kind of call of duty and beyond that, one could 
think of it. Now, this kind of people are rare. We all know that, but this is what it is. I thought these two people can be brought in as some kind of, you know, path setter, role setter, our own role model, not only at the corporate, but beyond corporate also should be the, uh, even at the political level, uh, every field that we can think of. So if we raise our bar up to that level, so maybe if I measure it zero to 10, I may be able to reach somewhere in five, six, seven, that itself will be fulfilling uh, you know, in our life. In the corporate, we all know Tata's are, uh, you know, they can qualify to be in this kind of category. And it's not so easy to carry on that legacy for the last more than 150 odd years. For one, two, five, one generation is okay. But when we think of Tata, we really think of ethics, beyond compliance, non-compliance, that's a different thing. But we can think of a business house with a strong uh, preference for ethics. That's why even the chairman at Emeritus, when you, uh, when you, when you saw him, uh, that is Ratan Tata, he is the symptom to me or symbol of the ultimate humility of the, of the person. Last two days, we are discussing about corporate government. So I'm not a, a politician. So therefore, I will uh, refrain myself from commenting any political issue. So we let's come back to our own field, that is corporate. We are discussing corporate governance. Yesterday's session also, I was there for some time. And then today also, eventually, corporate governance. I was just thinking that I think we are telling one thing to all of us, that it is a board which manages the entire organization. So therefore, they are the people who should be responsible to raise the flag of corporate governance in any organization. So be it, obviously. Because our corporate structure is so that shareholders are there to select the board of directors as the as their representative who will manage the, the company. No doubt about it. But when I think of it, then I first started looking into what exactly is the definition of corporate governance, what the board is supposed to bring in. We all talk about governance, but then what is the definition of corporate governance? I could not find much, but suddenly I saw one uh, report of the World Economic Forum and it said, it, it, this report was published in 2020, 2021. They have given a very brief definition of corporate governance. They say that corporate governance is laying down the processes very effectively and transparently. That is the first stage. Second stage, and implement those processes by taking all kinds of decisions. That decisions can be negative also, doesn't matter. So if I see it in the context of the corporate governance as a definition, lots of things are coming up. One is obviously processes to be uh, thought of. So it is decision, it is deliverables, it is identification of processes, it is transparency. So all these things combining together, we can think of that this is the governance model that we want to achieve. Uh, I was, uh, I, I could not uh, help but quoting uh, the Indian Prime Minister who said that, you know, it is for me, the government means good governance with delivery. Now, I, I think that's uh, very interesting because he is very strong in coining words and all that. We all know, but it means a lot of things. And I think what he said, that it is not enough, and that in the corporate sector also we have forgotten. We are only shouting corporate governance, corporate governance, corporate governance. That's fine. That's no problem on it. But it should not happen that delivery does not take place. So corporate governance mixed with the ultimate delivery. It should not so happen. As a surgeon, I come out of the uh, operating room and say, it's a wonderful surgery, no doubt about it, but the patient is dead, by the way. 
So it does not help us in any way. And why I say this, I think the expectation of the world on the board of directors has exceeded all limit. I think yesterday uh, in front of Baroness Varma, I raised the issue that if today I am trying to acquire a company in the European Union, I have to make sure I do not have any past records of human rights violation. Not only me, all my descendants, meaning all the suppliers, uh, the other chain, etc. No human rights violation. Now, will you please tell me, I am a businessman. I want to acquire a company there. And consciously, we will not abuse anybody or do human rights violation. So basically, are you trying to tell me without giving me any definition of human rights? So is it that what I have violated, according to you, my human rights have been violated, but according to me, nothing has been violated. So then who decides? We'll go to the court. Court will decide. And already Human Rights Act uh, in the EU and Human Rights Act here, 1996, these are all very highly emotional and uh, you know, debatable issue. Like we are all seeing human rights in the name of you know those immigrants, uh, those illegal migrants who are all coming here, and uh, people are rushing to the court and making money by telling uh, these are all uh, the individuals' human rights violations. So it is a big issue basically. So I really don't know what is expected of the board. Or I myself have developed uh, you know all kinds of uh, forced labor policy. Okay. Now, uh, human trafficking. So as a board, not only I will look after my business, but now I have to look after that whether there is any human rights violation, whether there is any exploitation, whether there is any uh, child abuse. All these are done because if these happen, these are all illegal. There are sufficient laws available to protect us for that. So what am I supposed to do with this as a board? I don't know. I'm confused. Just to put this onto my own responsibility. As a director, the English companies access, and this is basically the structure um, of, of the Global uh, Companies Act, that you are responsible for promoting the success of the company. You are responsible for ensuring that the uh, the, the, the you know businesses are being conducted efficiently, etc. Now, on the one hand, you are asking me that look into your corporate uh, human rights violation. I'm just giving an example. And then on the other hand, you make sure that the uh, your business is successful. So, if in the name of anything, any of these extraneous points that are coming on my head. If I withdraw from the business and if I suffer loss, then which balancing factor will help me? I'm not very sure. Am I trying to protect the human rights? I'm trying to protect the uh, global climate. I'm trying to protect my business. So which one I am protecting? Don't think even for a minute that I'm uh, not in favor of imposing all these things. But then let's have total clarity as a director what are we all supposed to do? So this is the question that always comes up in my mind. And that takes me to next phase of my uh, discussion. When people say board is responsible, accept it. No doubt about it. Board is responsible. Now, this kind of motherhood general, general statement, uh, to what extent these are all relevant, I'm not very sure. You see, I will be making some controversial statements, I think, during for your thought process. Nothing is, this will give you some food for thought. That's all, nothing more than that, because I refuse to go what I said yesterday, uh, uh, the inauguration time, that I don't want to do some tick boxing, corporate governance, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah fantastic. Both very, yeah, and I have ticked the box. I am the last word in corporate governance. So first, let us understand what is this corporate governance business. So therefore, there is, will always be a conflict. I can understand when I think Shell probably uh, came out of uh, the North Sea because of global disaster, uh, you know, 
on the on the oil that has got huge ramification because millions of people were affected and finally that uh, rig under the north sea it was closed up around 7 or 8 years back and eventually 60 70 80 billion dollar was to be paid uh, by by shell corporation from the from their own coffer so that i can understand this is a uh, you know catastrophical uh, challenge no doubt about it i, I remember when uh, i was working with alcan um, the subsidiary in uh, indian aluminium uh, in calcutta i was a company secretary and general counsel and then we wanted to uh, do mining and uh, because bauxite is needed to manufacture uh, you know uh, aluminium and we were told that the human uh, the activists they are preventing us from getting the access to the bauxite mines and uh, eventually the matter came to the court and the activists told to the court you know we have seen one bison no i have not seen any bison in the forest where the bauxite mine is there but then some footprints of a bison was noticed so therefore sorry mr corporate you can't go there and do the mining so there could be many issues and i know that uh, you know in india also there are so many uh, instances available where the development projects were stalled so again i am not getting into that because this is a more of a political issue than anything else but eventually if i can't expand and eventually my company suffers loss and eventually i am accountable to millions of shareholders so therefore if they ask me why i am not getting my dividend for year after year then what kind of explanation as a board i am going to give so this is something that uh, one has to keep wondering that in the name of corporate governance uh, are we not going too far you know in this country or especially in the west there is a tendency now and i, I am confronted with this question all the time as general counsel when you are engaging your global or non global law firms do you see the gender ratio do you see the inclusion do you see the diversity i said that i see nothing i just see nothing like arjuna in the epic mahabharata i am only seeing the fish that is i have got a problem i have to sort it out and therefore i am engaging your law firm you are the best please come and sort it out now that is also expected of us as corporate there is no law there but i am supposed to look into that whether this is the form where gender diversity is not there it is not that there is a discrimination or anything simply like baroness varma yesterday said no i am very sorry that all of you are men now <laughs> what she was supposed to do, she will say since all are men i am going out that is one thing he she can do but definitely this nobody any sensible person will not do or she could say that look guys and that is the advice what she gave that try to include uh, the female uh, also in the in the in your system or organization that i can make out but then suddenly you are asking me no you can't go to uh, become mckinsey because you know they are not good in terms of gender diversity i said but they are the best on tax no that i don't know and you you suffer at the hands of uh, you know hmrc or income tax and you incur loss and then the shareholders will tell you excuse me why you did not take the advice of no there is no gender <coughs> are we putting our money for looking into the entire world's problem or are we putting our money simply to make money so that we can get some kind of dividend and as corporate you have got many stakeholders public is one of them the uh, the you know environment etc these are all uh, one of them but then eventually i like uh, my friend udayan's <laughs> comments of course the first comment that i made which triggered the debate and then he was brutal in that way when he <laughs> told yesterday why i'll be paying for the follies of if i may say so the western world the same amount of money carbon emission and all that uh, our prime minister says that 2070 this country the prime minister says 
and then finally nobody is aware that it can't be achieved and then why we are pu- you are putting all kinds of targets on me am i born to save the world but i will make sure that i will not destroy the world to the extent powers are there in my hand i'll definitely do it but don't expect me to go and find out whether supply to the supply to the supply is breaching any human rights violation or not i mean then i think i require an army of people that's why you know the anti bribery act came here in 2010 effective from 2011 eventually it became a non starter nobody is bothered we have got implemented it everywhere we have got a policy and eventually that's why i serious front office here finally say okay baba what you do prepare a policy and give a certificate to your board policy has been complied with that's all because otherwise we can't do business i still remember when the act came uh, my employer one day i was to travel he called me up i said we are in serious problem i said why what happened you know i have got a potential customer whom i have to fly from somewhere in new york or whatever it may be to our uh, plant um, in india ashok leland osur because they could be a potential customer for buying uh, many trucks etc i said okay no problem can i lend my private jet to him i said now there is a problem now there is a problem because whether you will be caught under bribery act or not that you have to see and eventually uh, you know one good thing if you are working in a <laughs> corporate you become pretty practical finally and i said that because of this reasons please carry on otherwise that fellow will buy hundreds of uh, our vehicles and i am telling no under the law fine print i can't show it to you you require a magnifying glass to see it but there could be and then this is the most dangerous thing what i find with the lawyers there could be so it is a gray area i said nothing is gray as far as uh, general counsel like me is concerned either it is black or it is white either you do it or you don't do it don't say possible but this but is a very dangerous word for the lawyers so i can give you the whole night the story of uh, the sanctions problems that we are all facing we have lost millions of dollars worth of businesses but there i always use my danda and say there could be a potential problem so for god sake do not supply your products to those 52 sanctioned countries there could be problem there could be ramifications there could be so where it is necessary for the board or for uh, executives like us to, uh, to 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 stand up and say there could be an issue then we do it but where it is not there it's just not possible i am not the savior of the world i am just an employee who has been recruited to protect the interest of ultimate stakeholders that includes society by the way in any way so this is a dichotomy and now let's uh, come back so board we have conveniently said it is the board who is responsible so look at the board and when i see the board their implementation of corporate governance and all that one thing comes to my mind that you are asking this set of people there is inclusivity so that's why i thought i will pick up this table that will be better you know so these are my board of directors so they are supposed to uh, you know uh, decide but if i rely on this uh, ladies and gentlemen when you arrive at a decision as a part of corporate governance and some kind of uh, you know word uh, i have coined how much internal democratization exists so that there is a free fair debate discussions dissents and eventually we all agree yeah this is the best thing to do my friends here you know very well how board meetings are conducted it depends upon the company there could be completely family managed company there could be small company big company medium company there could be any number of companies and there could be uh, reliance with millions of shareholders but at the end of the day it is the family which decides so we indians have got uh, all kinds of structures available and you know i'm fortunate in the last 35 years uh, 
I have arranged, conducted, managed at least 5,000 board meetings in my life, or it may be more, even all kinds of companies, joint venture, non-joint venture, family, uh, then obviously publicly listed companies, large companies, small companies, so you can think of. And after retirement, I was thinking of writing a book, but I'm not getting any publisher. If you get somebody, please let me know. Okay, that jokes apart, my employer will be horrified if I make this statement to them. So therefore, the question is that, so you have got all kinds of board, you have got all kinds of, you know, representations. How much internal democracy exists in the board? And I can give you hundreds and if not thousands of examples. It reminds me, Mr. Guha's uh, hometown, Calcutta, and the same with me, the famous film, uh, by the Oscar-winning, world-famous, uh, our one and only Satyajit Ray. The film was called Shimabatha, meaning it's a limited company, Saga of a limited company. These are all 50s and 60s set up where this film was set up. And in the film, there was a very old company, English company, and the board meeting uh, was happening. And the directors are, I know you, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. So therefore, that kind of composition, I'm talking about 50s and 60s scenario. Now, obviously, these things are not there now. So therefore, an old gentleman who was 80 years old, he was a director on the boat. And then often he fell asleep. So when a very important decision-making process was going on, and when the question of voting came, he fell asleep. And then his co-director was doing like this. And he suddenly from the slumber, he wake up and say, yes, I agree. This is the kind of directors we all have it. You are all aware of it. And then immediately after thereafter, he fell asleep. That could be a little bit of, uh, you know, extreme, but Satyajit Ray was a genius. So that is the example which has gone into my head all the time. So this is for, you, you, from that level, 50s, 60s, we have come a long way. I mean, there's no doubt about it. This internal democratization, if we talk about governance, and I've given you the decisions of uh, the definition of governance, how it can be done. So therefore, a lots of questions are coming up how the decision-making is done, how debate is going on, are we encouraging debate? Why I said it, I said it with responsibility. When people approach me for becoming an independent director anywhere, I said, no, not at all. I'm not interested. Because only tick box I'll be there, but I will not have any role to play at the meeting, basically. All will be decided somewhere else whether it is a publicly listed company, because there will always be a majority shareholder who will finally uh, decide. And uh, again, I'm not criticizing. The other day I saw in the paper, Google CEO has uh, offered himself $221 million worth of uh, you know, salary. And there is a leaked email from Google server which says, no increment will be given this time to the employees. Now, obviously his salary was also approved by the board. Okay, so what corporate governance we are talking of, if this is the situation in Google, okay, I can't criticize if this uh, uh, really stop my link with Google, then I'm gone. So therefore, these are the issues that you have to think of. But since the time is short, because I was thinking that I'll be given uh, one hour time to really take you through which you people can relate with your uh, actual day-to-day uh, -day interaction with the board, that what kind of uh, board meetings are taking place, how decisions are being taken, what kind of interactions are taking place. All classic examples, you know, it, it is a challenge for any company secretary to prepare the agenda. No, 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 don't, don't, don't bring it. Uh, this I will only explain. And then the question of paper comes. I'll send it only at the last moment. Why do you want to send it uh, seven days uh, before the meeting, 10 days before the meeting? No, no, no need, basically. They are all aware, no problem. And then, of course, the, um, uh, the minute making, why it is needed, that is needed, and the directors keep uh, you know, uh, crumbling about it. And uh, you know, finally, whatever the chairman decides, that is the law. 
So there's a whole host of issues which you can think of if you think of some kind of the board meeting, how it goes, and eventually what is the relevance of that. So that's actually very, very important. Uh, welcome, Shastriji. I just gave the you know example of your grandfather's, uh, the ultimate, uh, which who fits into our topic, ethical leadership beyond compliance. And I give the example that he resigned as a railway minister, although he was not supposed to resign. I did not know you will be coming here, but still. So uh, my in conclusion, I will say that uh, corporate governance is a good business. I mentioned this yesterday also, what uh, Narayan Murthy has said. It is a good business. But I relate to not doing some social good, social corporate responsibility, but relate to, I'm a very cutthroat businessman. I'm telling you, if I don't uh, do good corporate governance, then definitely I am not going to get any kind of investment, any kind of business, anything like that. So corporate governance, let's fix the processes, follow the processes and implement them transparently without any kind of doubt, how the decisions are arrived at, people should be allowed to know. And the final thing is that we want more internal democratization of the board. And when I say that, mind that in a country like India, you have got 1 million companies. Out of that, I do not know the present figure, but could be 10, 15,000, 20,000 companies are listed. For listed companies, you have got tick box of stock exchanges. You have got tick box of all kinds of, uh, you know, other regulations provided by the SEBI. But then eventually, how those decisions are being taken at the board level, nobody knows. Is there any proper discussion on the basis of informed papers that are being circulated? No. So let's not confine ourselves corporate governance thinking that this is the corporate uh, responsibility that we are thinking of. This is much more than that. And that is where I will end by linking our topic today with the leadership. And that leadership, uh, you know, rests with the CEO of the company, not even the board of the company, the CEO of the company. If he believes in compliance, first question. Second thing, if he believes in leadership quality to be displayed all the time, every time, not missing one second. If he believes that he has to act ethically, ethically means absolutely as per his conscience, if he acts and eventually, if he always thinks my target is 10, but can I go in terms of my leadership beyond 10? Can I achieve that? And if he sets his target at 10, Ultimately, he will be able to achieve uh, seven, eight, or whatever. So, uh, friends, I think I uh, don't have the time to explain uh, further. So, I'll stop it here. Uh, and remember these words corporate governance, don't equate this with social good only. Because if you are a good corporate citizen, then automatically you will take care of everything. And, second thing, whenever you are attending a board meeting, Think of the internal democratization of the board, internal democracy, whether it prevails in the board or not, or whether I am not allowed to work or not, or uh, you know, raise my voices. So all these things are important. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe we can take questions. One Shastriji's matter is over. Udan or? Please work. No, no, no. Uh, he is joining me here. So, so Abhijit, I think, uh, thank you very much for what you said. And I think a couple of comments. One is you're right about the boards and specifically in the UK context. I, you know, between us, we know people, we know lots of board members. And there is this diversity, which is there in the tick box happening. So when they sort of, when they want to appoint non-EDs and what I call non-independent directors and all, they all use a filter nowadays. Do we have women or women? Do we have any diversity? And that's going out to the headhunters market, especially in the FT250 companies. But I have a different question. So if you look at, and you mentioned about boards and where they're a publicly company, no major shareholder, you know, the CEO and the board actually runs the company. What is your view of how a Credit Suisse can happen? A 150-year-old bank or what a vanishing overnight. The board should have played a role. 
and and you know them better than most other people given your interactions uh, given where you sit some views on that and secondly also you mentioned something that no i don't want to be an independent director what are the risks of anyone become an independent director of companies not controlled by a majority shareholder but let's say there's a private equity owned company or maybe a ft250 350 quoted company or outside the ft100 you wanted your views on that because you have enough experience to give comments on both sides i think credit street happened like 2008 everything collapsed happened everything happened under the watchful eyes of the regulator we are the common people we don't know but then if the regulator is strong then it does not happen i myself asked this question here that you have got ofcom ofgem every sort of thing but the moment i see the uh, my temps water bill when i see my energy bill i think there is no boundary there is no limit and the next day i read in the paper that temps water the principal outside the uk have been given a dividend of 14 billion pound forget about it so its credit is different issue so failure of the regulator failure of the system these symptoms were all watched earlier also but no action was taken there could be a variety of reasons but it is because of that only this thing happened second thing independent director because i think the stake is now too high you know you know the indian companies act indian factories act nobody wants to become the occupier we have an occupier he said give me extra money otherwise i don't want to become an occupier if a check is bounced i am going to the jail i mean this is really crazy now of course supreme court has come out with some decisions etc you just can't put me behind the bar so why on earth i will become an independent director with full responsibility not matching payment and then asking me be ready to go to jail also you know i i this is when i was working in bangalore in hmt the public sector the financial institutions nominee was there anything and everything we don't know i am only representing financial institutions then why on earth you are sitting on the board and then you know becoming a part of it by telling by declaring please make it very clear in your minutes that i i have no no role to play in the decision of expansion of your watch factory in tumkur i have nothing to do with this i am only here to protect the interest of the financial institutions later on clarifications uh, also came i'll give you two quick examples to give you the flavor of the board that i have seen one example i have given satyajit ray but that's mythical the other example i have seen the board spending 90% of their time to decide whether the em- uh, employees uh, you know uh, canteen the cost will be increased or not uh, maybe a few thousand rupees 90% of the time chala gaya 10% yeah udan will stand up and say i have got an acquisition proposal i approve that no problem on that you just take my uh, how much you are going to spend uh, 15 crores tab uh, theek hai no problem go ahead spend that money only that's all but the final board i have seen in my life when i was a general counsel and company secretary of suzuki motors that was really something which is astonishing because there was a height in 1997 98 99 2000 when the government of india and suzuki motor corporation of japan they were fighting for one year they were fighting i am the son and my parents are all fighting and bitter fight eventually what will happen to my business but that is the classic what i have seen in my life a life which, which i can believe in a board meeting the suzuki nominee and the board was i wanted to describe but this required time to describe there were diametrical views on the board five directors government five directors suzuki so they can do all kinds of fighting etc and uh, we were fighting in the high court and eventually in the international arbitration here in london the moment the board meeting starts the chairman representative of the government uh he looked at me and said abhi shall i start i said yes sir please start the moment is the suzuki director will stand up and say mr chairman you can't start the meeting i have been advised by my lawyer to read this statement a b c d a b c d so for 10 minutes we we have to listen to whatever he is telling was at as well advised by their lawyers and after this is over they bowed 
And they said, my sincere apology, I should not have done it by interrupting the board meeting and forcing you to read, to, to listen to my statement. But I have been told, you know very well. Now let's start business. And then after that, this is business as usual. Well. We cleared expansion. We cleared so many things. That's why Maruti today is what Maruti is. So this is the finest example. I, I do not know in how many uh, places uh, this kind of incident happened, basically. <laughs> Thank you. It's a uh, position that the appointment of independent directors can be done by a third party. Like, let's say the same DG appoints auditors for the uh, PSUs and uh, I think the RBI for banks. So is there a possibility that, you know, at least there's a greater semblance of independence that rather than the management of the company to make it, uh, a third party, like, let's say, the civil for the state entities, and the Ministry for uh, Industry Entities, that is beyond a certain threshold. Is that a viable appointment? Can you see that happening in India? Well, uh, the answer is yes and no. I mean, the issue is that it is possible to uh, nominate somebody on behalf of somebody. That is a possibility. But then the question that comes up is that how, what is the process that they are following. Is it again the tick box? Do you have a name? Uh, yes, I have got a list. Okay, Udarsan Ikaldo. I think Somia is very good as a director. She is the, uh, you know, the yes person. So take her on the board. And by the way, I am taking her as independent director. So how far he she is independent, only time can tell. That's what I said. If there is no internal democratization in the board, how on earth you can have independent director? That's why independent directors are all doing that uh, look, uh, subject to uh, provided, notwithstanding, I am uh, joining in your in your board. That's all, nothing more than that. So therefore, the real independent director's role will come when you have got a very, very vibrant board. And that board also, I have seen it in when I was the uh, executive director in Ranbaxi in Delhi. I mean, uh, we have got a very enlightened chairman, uh, Tejindra Khanna who was the Lieutenant Governor of Delhi at some point of time. He's coming here uh, next month. So he was a kind of person, he would allow every director to speak. So often there was quarrel, often there was a, some kind of shouting, everything. And he was a very cool man as a seasoned bureaucrat, former Commerce Secretary, former Chief Secretary Punjab. So he knew how to handle the crowd. So he allowed everybody to vent their anger or whatever. And many a times he put a brick on the promoters. Okay, that no, I think you, you just leave them, let them say whatever they wanted to say. So that is one of the finest examples that I have seen. So eventually I will say it depends upon what kind of selection process you run, list business or non-list kind of thing. How do you uh, take them on your board? Even if you recommend somebody, what kind of selection process I have got in the company to select really good directors, many things are involved. So by name, tick box, independent directors, only ask this question, how independent you are. And then still retain your position. That's actually important. <laughs> my case. Last year, there was a session uh, arranged by Harvard University. So I was asked to participate on the theme, whether the general counsel 
and company secretary, they will join in the boards or not. I said that it's very difficult for me to really come to a conclusion because as GC of the group, I have to look after the interest of the group. Whereas as a director sitting on the board, I have to look after the interest of that particular company. So this is a conflict of interest. And I asked this question to many experts and they say your primary responsibility will be towards the company. And if I say that there is a conflicting decision, the decision of the ultimate owner says, no, you will not go there. We will not invest. Whereas in the interest of the company, you have to invest there. So what is my decision? I got a one-line cryptic answer. So then you leave the organization. I'm sure that that, that cannot be uh, the ultimate thing. It's it's very, you know, this is another problem. Uh, now it has stopped to a great extent. Uh, there is a lot of expectation on the company secretaries. We all, all do wonder. But as governance professional, as uh, the legal professional, as CS professional, as an executive, always we should try to see that how to stand up against some kind of uh, you know improper decision uh, without thinking that I will be losing my job. Honestly speaking, in my present group, I have done it a team number of times. And once you start doing this, the organization will respect you. That's important. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.